Our presenter today is Julie Austin, and she is an R&D chemist at Biosynthetic Technologies with over 20 years of chemistry research experience. She has earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry with a focus on environmental biology, and Julie began her career in exploratory research and development at Riley Industries, which is now Fortellus. There she, managed, she made immediates for the pharmaceutical and agricultural industries. She then moved on to Great Lake Chemical, where she worked as a lead researcher on flame retardants for uh, thermoplastic resins and thermoset foams. And in 2014, Julie was recruited by the Heritage Research Group as a lead chemist in the development of an array of products, including safe aromatic oils and transformer oils. In 2018, we'd like to say that Julie saw the light and joined Biosynthetic Technologies and began working um, to develop on the development of the SLI technology. Julie has, is a 25 year plus member of the American Chemical Society. And you may have gathered from the topic of this we webinar, Julie is very passionate about proper sunscreen protection. With a family history of, sun of skin cancer, her inner scientist is compelled to debunk the myths on sunscreen. From the recent new cast on sunscreens and the improper use and application of sunscreens, it's essential that we all educate ourselves in the details, and Julie will help us do just that. She's a self-proclaimed sunscreen enthusiast with a passion, the knowledge, and the drive to educate people on the proper use of sunscreen and how to protect ourselves from the effects of the sun. So, Julie, the screen is all yours. All right. Hi, um, I'm Julie Holland Austin, and like Debbie said, I'm a process development research chemist for biosynthetic technologies. I'm usually not the one giving these webinars. In fact, this is the first one I've ever done, and I usually like to kind of remain behind the scenes and make the chemistry happen. But uh, I did this topic at a safety meeting a couple weeks ago, and I was asked by Debbie and, and Mark Miller, our CEO, to do a webinar on this. And it is something that I do feel passionate about, and so I agreed to do it. Um, normally, we like to start every meeting here with the safety topic, but this is actually the safety topic. So I don't think we need to do that. And uh, like Debbie said, this is very personal to me. Um, ever since I was a really little kid, my mom has dealt with skin cancer. Um, one of my very first memories of my mom was whenever I was very, very little and she had cancer moved on her nose and then on her cheek. And whenever she came home and they took the bandages off, um, she had these big black stitches and it really traumatized me as a child. I looked at her and I burst into tears. Um, and ever since then, she's had to have multiple, multiple cancers removed. And it's not just her, but it's her entire family. It definitely runs in the family. So, um, you know, like I said, I was pretty traumatized for it. Um, luckily for her and for the rest of her family, she's either had basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinomas, which are the least aggressive. She's never had a melanoma, thank God. Um, she was able to catch them quickly and have them removed. But over the years and through many phone conversations with her, she hears something on the news and I get these phone calls that says, oh my gosh, sunscreen caused cancer, what's going on? Should I stop wearing them? And then she wonders if she's doing the right thing by wearing sunscreen. Um, luckily for her, she has a daughter who likes to do research and I'm able to use my background and my research skills at, you know, to try to figure out where these news articles are coming from and help her figure out um, if she's doing the right thing. So uh, let's get to the point. Why do we wanna wear sunscreen? Um, so, um, the sun emits three different types of UV rays. This is UVA, UVB, and UVC. These are in the form of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths between 10 and 400 nanometers, which are shorter than the wavelengths of visible light. So they're just outside that spectrum. Luckily, because of our actions to control ozone um, depletion in the 80s and 90s, we don't really have to worry about too much the UVC rays, but UVA and UVB, we do need to worry about those. Now, the difference between these two types of rays are where they penetrate on the skin. Um, uh, UVA penetrates, penetrates deeper into the skin, causing wrinkles, sunspots, and loss of collagen, while UVB penetrates deep into the surface of your skin, and it or pen, penetrates the surface of your skin, and that's what's re, uh, responsible for sunburns. That brings us to myth number one. Um, sunburns are the cause of cancer, so we just need to worry about UVB. Um, that's not really true. Um, either type of UV will cause skin cancer. Um, not only that, but UVA rays are actually really strong during winter and on cloudy days. These are the ones you have to worry about when you hear that 
Um, you know, you should still wear sunscreen whenever it's rainy and cloudy or any time, any time like that. It's because of the UVA rays, not UVB. So right now it's estimated that 20% of Americans will be diagnosed with skin cancer at some time in their life. And that each day, 20 people in the United States die from melanoma, which is why we recommend using sunscreen daily and also choosing a sunscreen that has both full UVA and UVB protection. So um, the next question is how do sunscreens work? Sorry, um, sunscreen is an emollient that forms a barrier on the skin which protects against UV radiation. There are actually two different types of sunscreen. Um, this is a chemical sunscreen and a physical sunscreen. They both form protective layers, but they each kind of have a different mechanism of protection. A physical sunscreen is a barrier layer on your skin that UVA, UV rays cannot penetrate. These are commonly called mineral sunscreens or made out of zinc dioxide and titanium dioxide. Um, a lot of people don't like them because they're a little difficult to rub onto your skin, but we'll actually address that a little bit later. A chemical sunscreen actually absorbs onto your skin and breaks down the UV light before it can penetrate. In essence, it just neutralizes this UV on your skin. So with that, you'll be looking at active ingredients such as oxybenzone, um, avobenzone, octosalate, octocrylene. Um, if you pick up a bottle of sunscreen, you're probably gonna see a mixture of these um, some of them work for UVA, some of them work for UVB, so they kind of work in conjunction with each other. And there's somewhere upwards of 20 to 25 different materials that they can look at for sunscreens. So myth number two, sunscreens are more harmful than the sun. Sunscreens are more harmful than the sun. Um, this has kind of been a myth that's been perpetuated by internet blogs and even some, some reputable news sources. In fact, it was one of these news reports that uh, got a very a panic phone call from my mom about using sunscreen. And after I dug around on the liter internet a little bit, I found that the original report wasn't actually saying that it was the sunscreen it, that was causing the skin cancer. It was that people weren't using sunscreen correctly, which brings us to a valid point. What is the proper way to use a sunscreen? Now, if you're like me, um, you know, I live in Indiana, so we've got about nine months out of the year that we like to be outside. There's about three months that we tend to hibernate a little bit. But during those nine months, I love spending time with friends and we go on picnics and we go swimming, boating, kayaking, um, just pretty much anywhere where we can be outside. And I can't tell you how many times, even just the summer that I've been out with friends where I hear them say things like, um, I'll just put it on when I get outside or well, I wanna get a little bit of sun before I put it on. Um, this is actually the improper way you improper way to use a sunscreen. You should actually apply it about 15 minutes before entering the sun because you're going to start getting radiation as soon as you get out into the sun. Um, the thing is sunscreen doesn't need to activate or anything like that, but you do need to allow a proper drying time on your body for them to be fully effective. Um, you can kind of think about a sunscreen like a layer of paint on your skin. If you put a layer of paint down and then you put like a piece of cloth over it or something like that, something touches it, um, it's gonna transfer to that piece of cloth or, or anything that touches it. So with sunscreen, if you're putting on clothing, makeup, or even sweating, it can interfere with your application and you'll end up with a very uneven, inadequate coverage. So that's why you wanna do it 15 minutes before you get out in the sun, before you start to sweat, um, all that. So um, let's see, myth number three. I've applied sunscreen, so I don't need to use more. Um, what I use will be just fine, especially if I don't feel like I'm getting burned. This also is very wrong, and it's one of the reasons why myth number two, that sunscreen is more harmful than sun, it's the reason why that one actually exists. Because people feel very protective whenever they put it on once, and they'll stay outside in the sun far, far longer than what they should with just that one application of sunscreen. So if you're in direct sun, you're sweating, you need to reply every hour. Um, if you are swimming, you need to reply directly after you dry off after that. And even if you're not in direct sunlight and you're not sweating, you should still reapply at least every two hours. And then myth number four, the screens are a little bit messed up here. Um, myth number four is that I used a high SPF sunscreen so I can stay out longer. Um, so this is actually something kind of want to go into a little bit more detail on. 
SPF factor, which is the sun protection factor, is actually an indicator for sunburns caused by UVB rays, not the damage that can be done by UVA rays. And so when you're looking at that, you know, you're still getting all that damage from the, the deep rays that penetrate deeper into your skin. Um, UPA, uh, SPF is actually basically the amount of time you can stay in the sun without being burned. So if you know that you go outside and you can stay for 10 minutes in the sun without getting a burn and you use an SPF 15, you can actually stay out for about 150 minutes before you start to get a sunburn. But like I said, that doesn't account for UVA rays. Um, looking at the SPF number, um, what, it, what it is, it's the amount of photons coming from the sun that can penetrate your skin. So without any sunscreen protection on, you're gonna absorb 100% of those photons onto your skin. An SPF will filter about 93%, an SPF 30 will filter out 97, SPF will filter out 50, will filter out 98, and an SPF 100 will actually filter out 99, but there's nothing that will filter out 100% of photons. And remember, we are just discussing UVB. High SPF can lull people into feeling comfortable staying out for prolonged periods of time without seeking shade. And that's why we always recommend that you use a broad spectrum sunscreen that filters out both UVA and UVB and a bare minimum of SPF 50. So then what is the best way to apply a sunscreen? Um, one, one of the things you wanna do is you want to apply a proper amount of sunscreen. For a lotion type of sunscreen, you're gonna to wanna to use about one ounce for your entire body. It seems like a lot, but um, it's really, that's really to cover everything on your body. Um, it's about an average of a shot glass full if you're trying to think about what, what one ounce is. Um, the diagram here on the right shows a back, something called the fingertip unit, FTU. And for each parts of these bodies, like on your face, you should use three fingertips full. On your ears and neck, you use three fingertips full. On your front and your back, you use seven on each parts of those. Um, arms are three, hands are one, legs are six, and feet are one, or two each. And so that gives you about one ounce. And it, it seems like a lot of sunscreen, and it actually is, but, you know, you're you buy a bottle of sunscreen, it's not supposed to last you all summer. So um, if you're gonna be outside for an entire weekend, boating or having fun, fishing, anything like that, you probably should go through about an entire bottle of sunscreen every weekend. Now for spray sunscreens, um, again, you're gonna wanna choose a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen with an SPF of 50. You're gonna wanna apply 15 minutes prior to sun exposure. You're gonna wanna hold the bottle about one to two inches away from your skin and then you're gonna spray back and forth four times for each area of your skin and then rub in for 10 seconds. This will ensure that you're properly coating all sides of your skin. If you only spray once, not only will you not have the proper dispersion, you'll also have less SPF. In fact, if you just do once, you're only gonna get about 75% of the SPF. And so you're gonna have closer to an SPF 12 instead of an SPF 50. Also another thing with sunscreens, uh, spray sunscreens, is you don't wanna spray directly onto your face. Um, I've done it before, I've seen a lot of people do it. Um, they taste terrible, first of all, and you also don't wanna inhale any sort of aerosol, including sunscreens. Um, it's never a good idea to ingest any sort of aerosol. Instead, you're gonna to wanna to spray it onto your hands and then rub it into your face. And you're also not gonna to wanna to spray it on windy days, like you're gonna to wanna to spray it outside, but if it's a really windy day, opt for something different besides a spray sunscreen. Um, you're also not gonna to wanna to use it near open flames and it's really not recommended on small children. I know sometimes it's easier, um, if you are gonna use it on small children, then you definitely wanna cover their face so they're not inhaling it. Um, again, so application of physical sunscreens, and I said we touched on this earlier. I know quite a few people, me included, who have a hard time using these um, just because they don't rub in that well and they can leave you with a pale white cast, like looking kind of slightly crazy. Um, but one of the ways that you can help minimize this is to make sure that your skin's fully moisturized before you go. And um, it's actually a really, really good sunscreen. I like these titanium and butanium, or titanium and zinc oxide um, sunscreens a lot. So, um, Moving on, in addition to sunscreens, there's a couple of other really good ways to protect your skin. And this is gonna be in the form of clothing. Now a, cop a typical cotton shirt is gonna allow about 20% of UV to pass through it. They typically have a UPF factor of five. 
UPF factor stands for um, ultraviolet protection factor. And this, this actually filters out both UVA and UVB rays. So a typical cotton shirt will have a UPF factor of about five, which, about, which allows 20% of UV to pass through the fabric. And a standard beach umbrella actually allows up to 97% of UV to pass through. So they're not really good filters. But um, you, know, you talk about a UPF 40 or 50 and it's only gonna allow two to, one to 2% of UV to pass through that fabric. So for those who don't like sunscreen, like my husband, you can actually find shirts, long, teeth, long sleeve shirts, lightweight hoodies, shorts, pants, hats, even blankets, sun shelters, umbrellas made from this material. And what's nice about it is that it's super breathable and it's usually moisture wicking. So even though you might be wearing a long sleeve shirt during the summertime, it's actually cooling you because it's, it's wicking that moisture. The other thing you wanna make sure to do is wear sunglasses with a, at least a UV 400 protection. And uh, one other thing is don't forget lip balm with sunscreen, a broad spectrum sunscreen into it. I've had uh, several friends over the last couple of years who've gotten their sunburns on their lips. And um, first of all, it's very painful. And now that they've had one sunburn on their lips, they've gotten multiple sunburns on their lips. And uh, there's a really high increase of getting lip cancer after getting your uh, lip sunburn. And it's, like I said, it's extremely painful. Um, Let's see, this goes into myth number five. I don't need to use sunscreen because I'm indoors or it's winter. And though, although the chances of getting sunburned in the winter is slim, uh, you still need to be diligent against the UVA rays, which are just as prevalent in the winter as they are in the summer. And although you might not see, need sunscreen all over, um, you're still gonna need it on your face, your scalp, your lips, your hands, and possibly your forearm, forearms if you've got sleeves that you roll up. So you see, we're almost done, but I do have a few more things I want to point out about sunscreens. One, if you're swimming anywhere with, with aquatic life, please look for sunscreens labeled reef safe. Um, some ingredients in the chemical sunscreens can be harmful to aquatic life, including fish and coral reef. And I think we've all know that our Uh, Julie, you're muted. Okay. Where did I mute? Do you know how long I've been muted? You're, you're fine right now. You said for aquatic life in the beginning. So okay. The first, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there, but... <laughs> um, okay. So I kind of say we're almost done, but I have a few more things to point out about sunscreens. If you're swimming anywhere with aquatic life, please look for sunscreens that are labeled reef safe. Some ingredients in chemical sunscreens can be harmful to aquatic life, including fish and coral reef. Our world's coral reef systems are home to thousands of species of fish, lobsters, sponges, turtles, and so forth. And they're already threatened by pollution, overfishing, disease, um, climate change, and bleaching. So hopefully if you want to do your part to ensure that our world retains a lot of its biodiversity. One way we can individually help is to make sure we wear sunscreen that is reef safe if you're gonna be going in the ocean. And I even wear reef safe um, sunscreens in, in lakes and rivers and stuff like that if I'm just out kayaking or, or swimming or boating. And then um, one of the things you can do is look for these mineral sunscreens that are non-nanotized zinc and titanium dioxide. They're the safest ones that you can find for aquatic life and reef safe. And then a little extra PSA um, for those of us who wear makeup, there's a lot of products out there we use in our daily routines that have SPF in them from moisturizers to foundations and powders. But one of the things you need to keep in mind is that the SPF often found in these are not always broad spectrum unless they're otherwise stated. Um, the good news is that there are fully tinted, uh, there are tinted full spectrum sunscreens available which can help with your daily beauty routine. Um, to the right, I really like this picture. I found it on the internet. Um, it was a woman who did a series of sunscreens um, and she posted these on Reddit. And what she did is she took a UV camera and she used, going from the top left is her with no sunscreen or anything like that. So it's just her natural face under a UV camera. And then she used 15 different types of FSP, FPF, SPF products, including powders, moisturizers, and makeup, as well as sunscreen at the very bottom left. 
And you can see as we move to the right and down the picture, there's an increasing effectiveness of sunscreen ending at the bottom right, which is um, a really, really fully effective. Um, I've added the link to the article so you can investigate a little bit further um, to look at which sunscreen perform the best. And in addition for maximum effectiveness, sunscreen should be the last layer you apply on your skin. Um, you want it to be the, um, the, the, the first thing that the sun, that the UV penetrates. <coughs> and, um, sorry, mm -hmm. excuse me. Okay, and if the last thing is if you um, are using any sort of prescriptive lotions or certain medications, please consult your doctor or dermatologist to figure out which sunscreen is right for you. There are a lot of different medicines that can be photoreactive and you wanna make sure that you're using sunscreen if you're on certain medications or if you're using a, reg a daily regimen that has like vitamin C or any like trinitoic acid or any of those kind of things. Um, one more thing I, I'd like to address here is that um, I do know that there are, there are safety, there are concerns about safety of some of the ingredients in chemical sunscreen. I know the FDA has been looking into at least 12 commonly used sunscreen ingredients over concerns of absorption into the skin. I don't have access to that data that they're currently working on, but I can tell you a few things. In the US market, you might commonly see sunscreens marketed as PABA free. PABA is a paraminobenzoic acid or vitamin B12. In the 1970s, it was used as a UVB filter, but its side effects included skin irritation, skin sensitivity, and clothing discoloration. So it's actually been pulled off the market, but you'll still, still see that sometimes on suntan lotion. It's not anything that we need to worry about here in the United States, nor in Canada or the European market. Another one is the troloamine salicylate, which is actually the it's the active ingredient in uh, the analgesic asper cream, and that's also no longer sold in the U.S. sunscreen market. There was a recent recall of sunscreens, but um, due to the presence of benzene, but this isn't something that's inherently part of the sunscreens. It was more likely due to a cross-contamination at the manufacturing facility, and that um, the amount of an active ingredient in sunscreen is typically less than 20% of the total composition. You know, you've got a lot of inactive ingredients in there too. And none of these is um, usually more than 10% of, of the overall formulation. So even if there's a small amount of absorption occurring into your skin, it doesn't necessarily mean that the chemical is gonna cause cancer or anything like that inside your body. Um, there's multiple biological functions that need to happen before any one of those components is more harmful than not using sunscreen, which we know can lead to skin cancer and be fatal. That said, you know, that be said, just make sure if you're using the spray sunscreen so that you close your mouth because, you know, a little bit of absorption through your skin is very different than inhaling and ingesting them. And with anything, use your own best judgment on choosing the right sunscreen. If you're concerned about the health impact of the chemical-based sunscreen, physical sunscreens are a great alternative. They're getting better and better at being able to be dispersed on your skin. Um, and they're generally recognized as both safe and effective. So just a slight recap here. Um, you know, you're gonna wanna make sure to choose the right SPF for your skin type and what you expect to be exposed to. Um, you're gonna choose the type of sunscreen that you like the best or that you think is gonna be work best for you, the, both the physical and chemical, physical or chemical lotion, spray. Uh, there's also stick sunscreens that you can choose. Um, do you need an environmentally sunny, skin friendly sunscreen? Um, you know, make sure to um, protect your lips and scalp as much as you can. And you're gonna to wanna to use at least one inch or one ounce per part of your, for your entire body using that sunscreen, the, the fingertip method for a lotion, um, four, four sprays per part of your body. Um, the mineral sunscreen is also one ounce for your entire body. And uh, don't substitute moisturizer for sunscreen. And then one thing that I haven't broached on is that they do expire. So if you have a sunscreen that's been sitting around for a couple of years, you're gonna to wanna to replace those. And like I said, you know, a bottle of sunscreen isn't supposed to last you for an entire summer if you're somebody that enjoys being out in the sun like I do. Um, I can easily go through a bottle a weekend. So, and then some of the, uh, oops, sorry, some of the, the best resources I came up with this 
are from just looking at the FDA, and these are some of the websites I wanted to share with you. So the FDA, FDA the National Ocean Services, and the EWG, which is Environmental Working Group, which is a nonprofit. Um, when you're looking into research like that, be careful of getting this information off of blogs or even sometimes the media, which doesn't know the right way to interpret scientific findings. So I think that's about it. Um, I've got a QR, QR code here. So if you want to take a picture, uh, you can email me directly from that or you can send me messages. Um, so I think that's about it. And thank you for your time. And thanks for sharing your lunch hour with me. And have a great day. Um, Debbie, do we have any questions? Okay, yes, we do. Uh, okay. We actually had one question here. Um, um, and was asking about the PABA in Europe. Yes. So the question was whether or not should we want worry about PB, PABA in Europe, US, and Canada? How about the other countries or continents? And in the US, Canada, and Europe, P, PABA has been removed from sun, the sunscreen market. I don't know about Asia or some of the other some of the other continents. All right. Well, that's actually the only question that was posted, but if you um, yeah, that's that, that's I, I I love that you know Papa is it's been off the market for a while too and it's, it's just one of those things in marketing that you see like even now with like plastics you'll see like BPA free and that's on everything even though BPA sometimes wasn't even in those different markets so that's a I love marketing it's great. <laughs> All right, then we have a question also, it, and this is a chemical structure that I don't know because I'm not a chemist. Mm -hmm. It's TiO2? Yeah. What does that mean? What is, is it still acceptable? Titanium dioxide is acceptable, yeah. That's actually one of the better ones. It's usually found in mineral sunscreens, and it's usually found in conjunction with zinc oxide. And if you're concerned about, you know, because they do micronize those, and there was some concern about, you know, like, well, are, are these nanoparticles bad? You can find non-nanotized non ones. Um, it'll say directly clearly on the bottle and you can actually find those just at your Walgreens, Walmart, um, CVS groceries or CVS uh, pharmacies, they'll, they'll have those. So um, again, Amazon is also a really good place to look for um, different sunscreens. If, if you can find one that you like and you don't see it at your local um, grocery store, pharmacy or you know, bulk food store, um, Amazon is a great resource to get those types of things. All right, then we have a question here, um, which I'm assuming is from a formulator saying, what do we actually have left to work with with all these concerns out there? Um, I think mineral and I think mineral is going to be the wave of the future, really, um, because it, you know, you're looking at natural occurring minerals that, you know, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, they're naturally occurring minerals. They're not, you know, they don't need to be synthesized or anything like that. And um, they're extremely effective. All right, so then another person is asking you, what are, what are some of your favorite sunscreen brands? Um, so my favorite, I like Blue Lizard a lot. That's one of them I use a lot. I use the, um, I use a lot of, uh, there's, trying to think. Avino makes a really good mineral sunscreen that I like a lot that's actually um, kind of, it goes on a little bit clearer. Um, CeraVe makes a really good one and CeraVe makes just really good skincare projects in general. Would you recommend an aerosol or a lotion? Um, it depends. So I like, I personally like lotions the most, but sometimes an aerosol is good, if, especially if you're by yourself and you need something, you know, someone to get your back or you don't have somebody there to spray your back. That's where aerosols come in really handy is when, you know, those hard to reach places whenever you're by yourself or if it's just not convenient for somebody to, you know, kayak over to you and try to, you know, rub your back down with sunscreen. So, cause you know, I do reapply even whenever I'm out doing something like that. So I usually carry two types with me at all times. And then sometimes I'll carry a third type, which is just for face. Um, because I like the, you know, I like to make sure that I'm not going to clog my pores or anything like that. Are you noticing uh, more sunscreen companies integrating blue light protection? Um, you know what? I'm not actually sure what that is, but I'm going to look into it. That was right. blue light, blue light protection. Yes. 
Okay, I will look into that. I, oh, blue light from computer screens. That, that's a very good question. I have not seen anything about that and whether that causes any kind of problems. All right. And um, Stacy is actually sharing some other brands that she likes, Clinique and Beach Bum on our... Um, yeah, those, are, those are both really good too. As well as Australian Gold and La Roche-Posay Anthelios? Yes. Those are other ones that I've, I've used and I like them all, so. All right. Um, then we wanted to know if there's any alternatives to zinc oxide and titanium oxide? As far as the mineral sunscreens, no. Those are the two that we know that are effective, but I'm sure that, you know, scientists that are working in the cosmetic formulation, I'm sure that it's something that they're looking into to find out if there's anything else that we could potentially use. All right, and then a question on how frequently do we reapply sunscreen in a regular day? Um, so if you're just indoors like working and you're just sitting next to a window, you're probably gonna wanna do it about every two hours. Like, or if you're just, you know, just outside in general and you're not super sweating or anything like that, about every two hours. Um, if you're outside and you're sweating, swimming, it's, or it's a really intense sunlight and like you're just outside all day, no shade, no, no shelter at all then every 60 to 80 minutes is the recommended. And then thank you, Sherry, for sharing with us that zinc oxide provides blue light protection. Okay, great. And then we have another question on the environmental impact caused by titanium oxide and zinc oxide. Okay. Do you, do you know if there's any? So far, I'm not seeing anything that there's some question about the non nanotized or that about the nanotized and coral reefs that it could potentially cause a little bit of bleaching, which is why they're recommending the non nanotized, which is just going to be bigger particles of it. And uh, so far, that is what they are considering reef safe. So like when you go down to um, if you go to Hawaii, or if you go down to the Cayman Islands, they, they are, they say that those are acceptable and they're not seeing the harm done from those. All right, and then we have an answer, I guess, from Beth saying that titanium oxide actually blocks ROS and blue light as well. Okay. So that's Thank you for I'm, sharing that. They're, like I said, you know, they're, they're a little more difficult to spread on, but as far as all the sunscreens, and I, I am prone to dark spots, like I get melasma, it's like this discoloration of skin, and those are the ones that I've opted towards, and it really does help prevent that because it is a great barrier. All right. Is there any information on comedogenicity on sunscreen? On com so uh, uh, creating pimples, creating, uh, you know, causing pimples and. Um, that's where you're going to want to look for the ones made specifically for faces. Um, a lot of the problems, it's not the actual chemicals in that. It's the, the oils that they use to basically disperse them. So you've, you've got to look for the inactive ingredients at the same time as the active ingredients. All so, right. and so, some of them, like if you're using like, you know, silicone based oil or petroleum based oils, um, you're going to probably be a little bit more prone to breakouts, but it'll, it'll say on the bottle too, and they make them very specifically for faces. And then if you, another thing is that if you have really sensitive skin, you can actually use, um, formulations that they make for babies, which are going to be a lot less harsh inactive ingredients. So they'll still have the active ingredients of, of a regular sunscreen, but with just gentler diluents for the sunscreen uh, ingredients. I appreciate all the uh, recommendations of sunscreen that could be used, but one person is asking if we know of any personalized sunscreen companies available today. Personalized? Um, as far as like small ones or where they'll do a formulation for you specifically, I, I do not. I don't either, but if anybody on the chat is aware of any, please share. That'd be great information to yeah. have. Yeah. So any other questions from anybody? All right. Well, that's all we had for today. So thank you so much. Your guys are getting a little bit back of your day. Um, this was a little bit of a perfect uh, public service announcement from all of us uh, at Biosynthetic Technologies. We're very passionate about um, sunscreen and health and care, um, but also about the environment. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we share our knowledge and information with you. 
You have the um, QR code there with Julie. If you have any other questions, just scan a QR code. It opens up an email to her directly and you can answer any questions you probably could have, sir. So thank you so much for your time today and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you, everybody.